I was listening to the last uh, interview, just the last couple of minutes of the interview about the sound. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really uh, that was a lot of fun to hear. Yeah, the sound is so, so important in a Lynch film. So extremely important, um, extremely important. He's, I think, he's one guy who really understands that sound is as dynamic, and that's a word you've been using, mm-hmm. um, an element as visual. Uh, sound isn't supposed to just support the visual; it collaborates with the visual. Absolutely, so they're both on an equal level, right. and it was a lot of fun to hear. Yeah, for us too. Uh, now, you obviously spent a lot of time with Lynch when you were preparing for your book. I did. I was extremely fortunate, and uh, it was really one of the high points of my life. I know that you, you had to have gone in with some kind of preconceived notions of what he would be like. I absolutely did. What, what surprised you the most about him? Um, the thing, isn't that funny? <laughs> he asked me the same question. <laughs> Um, on the first visit, I, I uh, the first contact I had with David Lynch was a half an hour phone call, and uh, that was in '92, I think. And uh, it was, uh, I was not surprised by that um, because it was extremely intense. Mm. Uh, he spoke to me in Gordon Cole's voice. <laughs> <laughs> And you'd think, oh, you know, sort of, it would be so easy to write that off as, oh, this is just an interesting shtick, you know, and right. uh, I can't take this man seriously because he's, you know, he's a showman like like Alfred uh, Hitchcock, you know, with, mm-hmm. with all the little numbers that he pulled. But the fact of the matter was that I think he's very shy, actually. I think that's what that was about, and it's very hard for him to talk to people that he doesn't know, and it's, of course, as everybody knows, extremely difficult for him to talk about his work. And I think right. he just used the, the Cole voice as a prop. But the um, the conversation was so intense that I was just breathless when I put the phone down. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> really. Um, and this image just popped into my mind. Um, I felt as if I'd been holding fire in the palm of my hand. Mm. Make what you will of that. <laughs> okay. I don't know what that means either. <laughs> but that was that was the sensation that I had. Um, I think the thing that surprised me when I met him um, was... Well, so many things, really. One thing that was really very interesting, and this I had not, in, in, uh, I spent a week with him um, in his in his studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was between films, and he gave me hours and hours every single day. Wow. It was astonishing to me. Wow. It was. It was amazing. And what I had decided to do, because I knew that he didn't like talking directly, was I came prepared with art books of his favorite artists, hmm. and I came prepared with movies of his favorite directors, and we talked about those things. And it was easier for him to talk about that. But I think what surprised me most, and of course this is in my book, is I... As uh, I was, uh, I, I was a university professor for 26 years, and a critic and a scholar. And there's a certain habit of mind that you get into. Mm-hmm. And that habit of mind is that you acquire information. Right. And you acquire information by going after it with a certain kind of tenacity and perseverance. Mm-hmm. You know, you just don't stop. Um, and you keep going until you get it. Right. And what I realized when I was talking to David was that that wasn't going to work at all. <laughs> um, I felt like I was bumping into an invisible wall. And it was clear that if I kept going forward, I would get nothing. Right. Um, what I had to do was let go of every expectation that I had. Yeah, yeah. And just let it happen to me and that was very hard for me but it w- it was very very exciting 
Um, yeah. And I didn't know what I had learned from him until, you know, months afterward. I had tapes. I thought about it, I thought about it, I thought about it, and I realized that he was talking to me all along, just not in the way that I had expected. Right. He told me He told me everything. Uh, but he didn't, get, you know how we ask for an answer in this, like, tell me, tell me how you feel about this, you know, reporters that stick a microphone in somebody's face when they're, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. The child is dead in their arms. It, how do you feel about this? I mean, it's just sort of a strange American grossness. Um, but I realized that in letting go, a thing sort of came in through my nervous system. I, this sounds bizarre, but uh, but in fact, that is true. Well, you know, it do, it actually doesn't sound bizarre. What you're describing about you know letting go and sort of letting him you know, do the work on his own. It sounds like a David Lynch film. It's kind of the same way yes, you have to go yeah. into a David Lynch film. That's, That's what I was going to say, too. Oh, who am I talking to? There are two voices here. There, there are three of them. There are three of them. <laughs> oh, sorry, okay. I, I'm Jamie. I'm right, Jerry. Jamie, uh, yeah, and Jerry. And I'm Jerry, Chris. are you the one who said it's like watching a David Lynch film? No, that was Chris. Chris said Chris. That. Hi, Chris. Yeah, that's how I learned how to watch a David Lynch film. Huh. That's very uh, Because if you read a lot of the criticism, see, my book came out in 97. Take a look at the criticism before then. It's people imposing old structures mm-hmm. on his film. No way. You know, oh, he doesn't have a three-act script. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, okay, right, he doesn't have a, th- a three-act script. Um, and, you know, he, he's, what is he doing with genre? You know, all this kind of thing that people are, are saying, that he's weird, that he's crazy, that he's miserable, that he's mean, that he None loves of these violence. Things. You do have to let go to watch a David Lynch uh, film. And it seems to me that, that, you know, it's wonderful to hear you say that, Chris, because it seems to me that more and more, and I'm, sh- I'm sure it's a generational thing as well as the turn in criticism that has taken place. Um, a, a little self-serving of me, but, you know, since my book. Well, I read your book before Mulholland Drive came out. Okay. I had actually read it like two weeks before it came out here, and that helped me out a lot. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Those are the nicest words I ever hear. Uh, no, your oh, book is... Okay. a really wonderful because a couple books came out at that time but yours was by far like the most interesting the most in-depth um about him and his films up to that point well thank you and and you've written so extensively about about lynch's films and i I wanted to know your thoughts on a few things sure go uh would you say that uh, david is a good storyteller very good storyteller brilliant but keeping in mind if you think you're going to get a story like Once Upon a Time, there was a princess named you know, mm-hmm. uh, Cinderella, you can go home. Um, <laughs> you, ha- you have to let him tell his story the way he tells it. Right. And he's always telling you while he's telling the story, let go. Let this happen to you. Absolutely. And the loud sounds that you were talking about. Right. And a lot of the visual techniques, it's about, you know, stop trying to control this. Yeah. Love it. Get into it. Mm-hmm. Let it happen. Enjoy it. But not in a mindless way. It is going somewhere. It has a direction. It has a shape. It has a beautiful form, and it is a great story. Mm-hmm. But you've got to let him tell it the way he tells it. He's an artist. He's a storyteller. Right. It's beautiful. For, for me, it feels like people that seem so preoccupied with with uh, uh, discussing the m- meaning in his films uh, are missing out on something somehow. Uh, when, when there I, when is a meaning, but uh, tell me a little bit more about that. What do you mean by preoccupied with meaning? Well, when when I see his films, I see them as kind of uh, uh, Rorschach. Uh, uh, ink blot uh, test. Uh, um, you know what? Do, how does this make you feel? What do you see in this? Right. And this is part of the reason why I completely understand why he himself doesn't discuss meaning, because that that's the creator telling you what it, what he he where he was coming from, and that's the word of God, and you know that kind of belittles <laughs> your thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, um, some interesting but, things you're saying. But do you think that um, his his films are meant? to be puzzles, uh, or, or puzzles waiting to be solved, or 
Are people no. missing out on something if they do that? Um, they're missing out on something if they do that. And, and this may sound strange. At the same time, they absolutely have a meaning. Right. But uh, uh, the puzzle mentality is a controlling mentality. Mm -hmm. The Sherlock Holmes mentality. Notice that uh, Agent Cooper, he's a brilliant detective, but he's not a Sherlock Holmes type detective at all. Mm -hmm. he, has to, he has to let go and let the dreams come to him. Yeah. And yeah. there <laughs> is a meaning. But not if you insist on reaching out, grabbing it. Because the truth of the matter is that, right, and we all know this, we know it intuitively. <clears throat> Excuse me a second. Let me take a little water. No. <clears throat> Rationality understands nothing but what it already knows. Mm -hmm. It's intuition, sense, sensuality. Um, instinct and something, a higher form of spirituality that is capable of new thought right. and new consciousness. Um, that's a hard one for people who are doggedly rational because, I mean, like I've been accused of being New Age, which really translates into fluffy-headed. Uh, <laughs> anything but. Anything but. I'm not that sort of person at all. I'm not that sort of thinker at all. But what I've learned to do is to have a new experience and to, um, to work with creators on their terms. So at the same time, if you, if you make the Lynch movie into a puzzle, you miss the whole movie because right. it's a sensory experience. But sense is intelligence of a very high order. Eventually, it has to collaborate. Is this mean, does this mean anything to you, what I'm saying? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. It, what I take from it is you kind of sit through the movie and experience that, you know, that sensory experience, and then what I do after that is I like to think about his movies afterwards. If I want to you know, work on the puzzle part of it, if I want to try and understand something about it. I think about it afterwards, but if yeah. I let my mind get caught up while I'm watching one of his movies, it's a waste of time, you know? It's just very I agree confusing. With you. Yeah, I, I have to agree with Chris there. It's not like you're watching one of these films that have those trick endings or anything and you have to no. go It's like no, these, these are real these are real pieces of art and they're meant to you, you think of, and you think about them long after you leave the theater or watching them. Yeah, I I I think that's a very fruitful way of doing it. Um, and I think that the way that, you know, I've learned to read the movies from talking to David, um, whom I like very much, I find him to be not weird, but kind and generous. Um, and he's a, he's a pleasure to be with. Um, he, he really is a pleasure to be with. He's got an open heart. He's got an intuitive mind. He's full of life. And he's full of enjoyment. Mm -hmm. You know, joy. The world is a joyous place for him, um, which, of course, uh, one of the great misconceptions is that um, he's dark and that these films about, are about how bad life is. But, you know, one image that I like to use when I talk to students or friends or, you know, people who would just, you know, are wondering how I think about it or, or what I feel is, you know, in the fairy tale, uh, the treasure is guarded by the dragon. Mm -hmm. The darkness in life uh, is the dragon um, that's in the way of everything that's joyous and wonderful about life. And Lynch's stories are about us encountering that darkness so that we can get past it to what's great about being a human being. Absolutely, and there there is there is a redemption uh, at the closing of most of his films. Yes. Um, uh, what kind of themes we spoke about this earlier with uh, with Toby? Yes. Yeah, so yes. You know he's he's had such kind of an idyllic upbringing. What what um, where does the darkness come from? Um, who had such an idyllic upbringing? Uh, David. David. David yeah. Yes. Okay. The darkness comes from. Look around you. 
do you think that America is a happy place? I, okay, I was yeah. thinking that. No, I get that. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Do you see what I'm saying? He is, he is not afraid to look. Right. And he believes that beyond all the junk that we're saddled with and the crazy um, oh, things that we're taught to want that are totally useless, <laughs> uh, you can get beyond that, but you can't do it by reasoning it, you have to, as we've been saying all along, um, let go, which is very hard to do, and get to that spiritual place in you that sees beyond um, the false way. Now, there, there are true things around us, too, but there are a lot of false ways that society is organized mm-hmm. um, where... Um, we're taught lies, really. Um, and one of the lies, well, never mind, I, I don't want to get too too <laughs> caught up. But, but if you can, get, you can get beyond that, and I think that's one of the motivations of his, um, his David Lynch Foundation where he's trying to help kids learn how to meditate. Exactly, right. yeah. It's a very beautiful thing that he's doing. Oh, it is. It I think is. so too. I think so too. Um, I'd like to ask a question. Um, yeah. yeah, Speaking please. of, um, since you are, do you think just talking about what we've talked about where the dark things come from? Do you think that Inland Empire, which I've only seen once, and I actually feel guilty even talking about it as <laughs> one viewing, but I just want to ask you because you you know so much about him, his style and everything. Do you think is Inland Empire David Lynch's reflection of post nine eleven America? No. Okay. I just thought that. Oh, well, excuse me. Excuse me. Forgive me for saying it that way. Um, I don't think so. Okay. Um, but if you think so, then you ought to, you know, sort of. For, oh, you're absolutely right. I've seen it three times, and um, the DVD is coming out July 21st, and you know, sort of, <laughs> I'm first online, <laughs> uh, and I expect to just watch it and watch it and watch it. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, because it's it's just uh, I think it's his it's his greatest work to date. Um, but what I think it's about is um, I think it's about everything I've been talking about now. He uses the vehicle of a woman artist, right, dealing with Hollywood, right as a way of talking about how if you get into yourself far enough, you can transcend um, the uh, false things around you and the problems around you. Mm. And what's real, I mean, Fellini, uh, are you familiar with uh, the films of Federico Fellini? Yes. Yes. He says the same thing. But what he says is you have to lose the world in order to do it. Remember that in in, uh, Inland Empire, she turns in a successful performance that her director thinks is going to win her awards, but the most important thing that happens to her is an internal uh, uh, adventure that takes place while this was happening. And I think that that's what that's about. No, okay, no. I just figured I'd ask. I just wanted to ask it. Just that is that is the beauty of Lynch. Uh, Absolutely. Whatever you see in it, that's what it is for you. Well, I'm I'm you know sort of uh, I think I think that's one stage of right. of of um, enjoying art. Whatever it is for you, that's what it is for you. But I do believe that if you stay at that level. You never get beyond your own boundaries, right? And that eventually, you have to you have to question whether you are limiting. And I'm not just talking about Lynch now. Any work of art, whether you are limiting it to your own experience, and whether the work of art can help you if you you know listen to it carefully enough and question some of your conclusions and talk to people that you trust um, who are also, you know, thinking about it. I think it's very important to get beyond 
your boundaries or you 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 don't you know develop as a person right absolutely to to let go what we were discussing yeah, earlier it's all about letting go um, i find it you know it's a challenge um a big challenge for me but it's one that i've grown to love yeah I want to talk to you um, about some of the recurring themes, or at least one of the recurring themes in Lynch's films. Sure. And that's his depiction of the abused woman. Yeah. Uh, um, I know this is uh, some point of controversy uh, in his films, uh, but what are your thoughts on on, on on how he depicts women in his films? Right. Um, well, one of the funniest moments... Um, you know, during my first series of interviews with him that I was just telling you about, mm-hmm. was <laughs> I said to him, uh, "Are you a feminist?" I thought his teeth would fall on the floor. I'm, nobody has ever asked him that question in his life, and his answer to me was, "Well, Martha, there's always room for improvement." <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that I think that he has an uncanny ability. People have asked me if he's gay, mm. um, and the reason that they have, I think, I mean, I don't know why the hell they would. I mean, he's definitely not gay, um, but I think that the thing that's extra- one of the well, many things are extraordinary about him, but one of the things that's extraordinary about him is his uncanny empathy for female experience. Right. His heroines are amazingly observed. I mean, in Twin Peaks Fire Walk with Me that you were just talking about, um, is very difficult or was at one point, for men to watch because they were being forced to put themselves in the place of a female victim of abuse, yes. the last thing an American man wants to do. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Uh, the fire walk with me is a highly emotional experience for me when I, when I watch it. I believe it. Yeah, and what, what's your take on the, um, one of his most infamous scenes, which is from Wild at Heart, the the Bobby Peru Lula uh, motel room scene. Right. Uh, do you think that's a scene about female empowerment? Uh, I read an interview with Laura Dern where she believed that it was. Well, uh, why did she think it was a scene about female empowerment? Uh, I, I believe the point. Uh, her point was ultimately that that she um, that she um, there's no delicate way to put this that she got off on the experience mm. uh, with wow. Bobby Peru. That's interesting. And so she, that that was not uh, it wasn't conducive with her being victimized. Um, well, I I think she's a marvelous actress, right. and I think she's a very bright woman. Um, you know, I I always like listening to her talk. I wouldn't exactly say that's correct. <laughs> um, I mean, I, if that's what motivated her to be able to do the scene without feeling humiliated, then fine, that's not a problem. But it seems to me that Lula is living in a world that is very abusive to women. Mm-hmm. And um, that Sailor, in his own way, participates in that and that this is a movie that sees through the abuse but doesn't join it. The film is not abusive to women. It's about a society that is abusive to women. Right. And I think that's a feminist point of view. Right. Um, I think that uh, it's simplistic to only want to show women who are strong and in charge because that's not real. Mm -hmm. I I think that showing what Lula had to put up with and how she had to deal with, you know, um, things happening to her uh, is, and sympathizing with her, not making it look like fun. Uh, You remember in James Bond when he rapes Pussy Galore, but it's put in the movie, it looks like a wonderful love scene? Yeah. Okay, that's what I call anti-feminist right that is you know sort of making rape look like fun uh this didn't look like fun at all 
And so the notion of a man who can do anything he wants to you because he's bigger and stronger, he, he, I mean, he looked about as bad as anybody can look, I think that's a feminist point of view. Right. But she was not empowered. As I see it, Lula was in a very bad place in that movie, and um, we were to understand that she was in a bad place in that movie, and we were to understand it wasn't because there was something wrong with her, but something wrong with him. Absolutely. Right. It always seemed like a kind of curious take on it, and I, I re-rented the, the Wild at Heart DVD the other week, and, and it's there in the extra features where they're speaking to, to the female empowerment uh, theory. Mm. I just need, wanted your take on it, but I can't let you get away without asking you about uh, The Sopranos. <laughs> we're, we're doing a show next week uh, dedicated to The Sopranos. Uh, you're before kidding! The, yeah, before the series finale, and yeah. and you're working on a on a book. What what kind of uh, what kind of take uh, do you have on The Sopranos? Well, 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 well. The show isn't over yet. I don't have any take. Uh, the story has not been completed. Uh, for my book, Dying to Belong: Gangster Movies in Hollywood and Hong Kong, that you very kindly mentioned up front. Um, it's about the history of gangster movies in Hollywood and Hong Kong, but I did interview uh, David Chase extensively, mm. which was another very wonderful experience. I really like David Chase. Oh, I bet. I had great time talking to him. He's a really bright, wonderful man. Um, uh, and uh, the, the last chapter in the book and the afterword in the book are very much about the Sopranos. Um, so I can't give you my take on the entire show because I haven't seen it yet. Right. right. But if you want to ask me a more limited question, I, it would, I, I love talking about the Sopranos. It's, you, know, <laughs> Who doesn't? you know, David Chase loves David Lynch. He's I think inspired. I read that, yeah. I, I, would, I would understand that. I can understand that. And like David Lynch, he has a real knack for uh, music. Uh, the, yes, the, yeah, yeah, he the does. musicality of uh, of what he does. And look at the sound in The Sopranos. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's been very, very much inspired by by David uh, Lynch, um, and and he has, of course, his own blazing talent. I mean, there's a great storyteller. 